at this point, um, if you were building the server, and, and we'll probably do, do this offline, but um, the next step we recommend, and it's in our manuals, is to go out to our support site and get the latest firmware. There's actually up to five pieces of firmware in the system. Um, everybody's familiar with um, the BIOS, um, but we also have, if you want, want to call it that, a BIOS for the management controller, uh, or the BMC. Uh, there's some code that we have on the board that puts the latest uh, updates into our processors. Uh, that needs to get updated. So there's at least three, and maybe as, as many as five, depending on what hardware you have installed, pieces of firmware. You can go down um, to uh, support.intel.com, look up the product you have, and I happen to have loaded all the firmware here. Oh. And we can actually do the flashes without an operating system on board. Really? We have, uh, you may have heard this, uh, heard of uh, EFI, mm -hmm. EFI BIOS. Yes. Um, our EFI BIOS on board, we can boot to a small operating system in firmware. And it's a command line structure. You can use DOS or Linux commands. There's, in the manual, there's a, a small list of commands. So we can plug this into the front of the system. It has the firmware on board. I can mount this drive, change, you know, the, you know, the active, um, um, it's, you know, the, the, the active part of the operating system over to this, change directories, and then there are script files on here that will do the updates for us. Okay. And it can all be done before we ever load the operating system. It's one of the philosophies about servers. Many people uh, will tell you that once you get a, a system set up, um, you, many folks are very cautious about doing BIOS updates after the system is up and running. Mm -hmm. um, the, the philosophy is if you don't have a problem, don't try and fix it. Yeah. Um, and you may create problems. Uh, it, it's potentially possible. Our recommendation is to update it to the latest firmware level before you start, load the operating system, and then freeze your configuration. And those firmware updates will just make sure that you have the latest code as far as compatibility, reliability? Exactly. Um, many things, uh, people oftentimes wonder what it is that you can be correcting in, in a computer that's, that's already launched. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes um, we'll find a customer that uses a, um, an old Microsoft um, natural keyboard that dates back to, you know, back when maybe I was back in school. Um, but it doesn't quite have the same USB timings that, that everybody works to today. Mm -hmm. um, we have to go and, and fix situations like that. So there's small situations that come up with um, obscure I.O. And, and, um, and other options that you can add into the system. We have to correct those, and those, that's the sort of thing that you see in those BIOS updates. So a lot of times you'll just be correcting so that legacy hardware might, exactly. be, uh, might be fully functional with the new system. And uh, if you're really curious about what's exactly on the, um, uh, the updates, there is a file on the firmware, uh, you know, files that we, we download uh, when you get your, your, your latest firmware, that actually goes through the painful process of listing out all the changes we've made um, with each update. Uh, in most cases, you'll never see an issue with what comes from the factory, but we make changes so often, if you've bought a system, it's almost guaranteed that there's going to be a new version of firmware available uh, for you to update. So kind of like with the desktop system, after it's all installed, generally you want to get the latest drivers. Yes. Um, which I'm sure is also part of the, uh, once we get the operating system installed here, but in the same way, you just want to make sure you got the latest and greatest exactly. of, of all the firmware available. Now, you, you actually mentioned something there that's very interesting uh, when you talk about drivers and operating systems. Um, again, a difference between a desktop system and a server system. Um, there's a lot of folks out there who are quite willing to take an old desktop that was kicking around the office and you know, load a server application, like my friend's garage, for example. You know, the, the, the application doesn't know whether it's on a, a desktop system or a server. Mm -hmm. But as we're, we're going to be talking with the folks at Microsoft in a few minutes, um, there's a difference in the operating systems. You don't want to be running a desktop operating system for server applications. And when you run a server or a server operating system, it's expecting to see a, um, a Microsoft tested platform to be installed on. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're going to get the, you know, the messages about your drivers not being um, certified and so forth. And when you buy a system from us that's a server, server system, we've tested it only on server operating systems and they're on the, what we call WICL or the, the Windows Hardware Qualified list. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a complete package and it is really a server that, as you can see, pretty easy to build. Oh yeah, that, that didn't take very long at all. <laughs>
So the hardware build portion of uh, the server build is complete. Uh, we have plugged in, of course, mouse and keyboard and a monitor here, and we've now entered the BIOS, which was done just by pressing F2 on startup. And now Bill's going to take us through a couple of the pre-operating system installation recommendations. Yeah, and, and we mentioned before, uh, one of the critical things about flashing the BIOS um, and getting some of the other firmware updated is the fact that well, we, you notice we've unplugged the fan here so that we can keep it under control for the purpose of uh, videotaping. Until we update the firmware on the management controller, the management controller doesn't know that there's a fan connected to that connector and a handful of other things, so it doesn't know how to manage the fan speed. Once we get it updated, the, you know, the, the acoustics become very tolerable. All these things will fall in line. Yes. All right. So, um, if, um, if you're you know, particular about knowing which BIOS version and so forth you're in. This is the, you know, the main screen is where you would, um, you would find yourself after you, you know, did the F2 and booted into uh, the BIOS. Um, we'll go over to server management and I've already scrolled down to system information. And here's where you're going to find um, the board part number, the board serial number, um, and the firmware revisions. I told you there was three, re, you know, three pieces of firmware that we care about, uh, and there they are, um, the BMC or the Baseboard Management Controller. Um, this is a, a piece of firmware used for, um, for the, uh, uh, our processors, and um, the, well, there's an SDR revision level. Um, so that's, that's, you know, if you want to record that, that's where you find it. Now, the real trick here is boot options, and this is where we're going to do this. We don't have an operating system loaded yet, so what we want to do is to come down here. Um, I'm sorry, we go over to Boot Manager. All right, so let's do this again. Boot Manager, we talked about this earlier. We're going to need to, to boot and update this. We don't have an operating system loaded. What we can do is we can go over to Boot Manager, and we're going to boot to the internal EFI shell. That's a you know a, a f extensible firmware interface. I think what EFI stands yes. for. But we've got our USB key, and uh, we'll stick the USB drive. Maybe. How many uh, hours do you think people spend trying to figure out how exactly to? Uh, how how to orient the USB? Yes. <laughs> um, so oh, there we go. Question. We have the um, USB key in, and off we go in theory. There we go. Good. And this is the command line uh, basic operating system you were talking about? Yes. Uh, so now you should be accessing the your USB drive that you plugged in? Yes, that's correct. Uh, now we should be able to change directories to the firmware directory that I created last night. These are just uh, standard DOS commands? Yeah, it's actually a mixture of, of DOS, DOS and Linux. Okay. So um, I could do an LS um, or a directory. Oh, okay. Either one. Um, now, you notice that the, the script files, the .nhs files, are highlighted, mm -hmm. which is kind of handy. And uh, we notice that the script files are um, highlighted for us. And the startup file, if you wanted to just update the BIOS or the, uh, you know, the FRU SDR information, you can do those individually. We're going to do them all, and we'll, we'll just type um, startup. And uh, one at a time, we'll go through these, starting with the, uh, the BMC, which is the management controller. Okay. And as with uh, any firmware update, you don't want to go in and fool with the system while it's doing it. Just punch it in, and it will uh, update the firmware, and just go down the list one, two, three, yep, four? Yep, that's exactly it. Okay. And uh, we notice that the script files are um, highlighted for us. And the startup file, if you wanted to just update the BIOS or the, uh, you know, the FRU SDR information, you can do those individually. We're going to do them all. And we'll, we'll just type um, startup. And uh, one at a time, we'll go through these, starting with the, uh, the BMC, which is the management controller. OK. And as with uh, any firmware update, you don't want to go in and fool with the system while it's doing it. Just punch it in and it will uh, update the firmware and 
Just go down the list one, two, three, yep. four. That's exactly it. Okay. And the updates are complete. With the firmware updated, the last step we need to do before we install the operating system is to set up our RAID array. And if you've ever set up a RAID array before, that is usually done in a pre-operating system environment. Uh, so as we're going through the post here, the RAID card here is going to put up a little prompt that gives us a keyboard shortcut, which I believe was Control G. Yes, and I, I, I think I believe I hit it. Keep going, I'm sorry. So after hitting Control G, we'll go into that RAID configuration utility, and we're going to set up, uh, I believe we're going to set up a RAID 1. Mirror, yeah. RAID 1, so we're going to mirror uh, our two, two terabyte hard drives. Okay, so we've done the Control G. We're into the startup screen for the, uh, or setup screen for the RAID controller. Uh, since we only have one RAID controller, it's easy. It's selected. We'll hit start. I like the mouse support. Yeah, and actually this is one of the things that came with EFI so many years ago when they created it. Um, and I'm surprised it's not in the BIOS, but we initially created EFI uh, to be able to give you, among other things, mouse support in the BIOS setup screen. We're into the, the, uh, the, the RAID console, the RAID setup console. We find uh, that uh, the RAID card has found our two drives, and one by one we're going to go into these, uh, these drives, and uh, we're going to be going through the manual process of setting this all up, so we're going to make, uh, select Make Unconfigured Good. And now we're into the, uh, the second disk, same thing, Make Unconfigured Good. Go. And we will back up. Now we can see that both drives are blue. We should be ready to go with the wizard. For our purposes, we're going to uh, we're doing a new configuration. And yes, we are sure. I'm going to choose manual since we know exactly what it is that we want to do. Okay, so we have our virtual volume there. And we can move along. And there we've got our virtual drive set up. And this is the preview. It's configuration file. Click accept save. Yes, so we accept the configuration. We'll save it. Now it's going to initialize that RAID volume. Yes. So we'll say yes. Okay, so we now can, can see the RAID volume. We've got to finish the initialization process. The first thing we want to do is to set this as a boot drive. We'll click go. And now we'll want to do a fast initialization. That was quick. That was very fast. The fast initialization is fast. And at this point, we should be done. The, uh, the, the, the virtual drive is created and ready for loading an operating system. All right. Now we move on with the uh, more commonly known procedures for booting off of the Windows Small Business Server 2011 disk that we have here, which I will first need to remove from the plastic packaging. At this point, we have booted off of our Windows Server installation disk, and at this point, it wants us to tell where to install the operating system. Now, since we've set up a RAID array, uh, the Intel RAID card that we have installed is not immediately recognized uh, by the Windows Server installation disk. So at this point, we want to use the Load Drivers uh, button right there, and we have uh, loaded that driver for the RAID card on a removable disk. And once we load up those drivers, we'll recognize the RAID array that we set up, and we'll be able to tell Windows Server to install onto that array.